Welcome to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. I'm your host, Dan Kidder. Our podcast is all about issues facing Southern Utah. Here we will announce your upcoming events, talk with movers and shakers in our community about important issues facing Beaver, Iron, Kane, and Washington counties, and make sure you are kept in the loop with interesting news and commentary of local interest. While we welcome folks from all over, our goal with this podcast is to give residents of Southern Utah a place to find out about issues that affect them. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and also on our Facebook group, What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, and online at What's Really Happening SU.com. You're listening to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast with your host, Dan Kidder. Okay, we are back in the studio today. We thought we were done with our debate series, but actually this is going to be fun because in the studio today joining me, I have Miss Mary Foremaster, who's also running for school board. She even brought me a doctor's note from the hospital. She wasn't able to attend the previous debates, um, and she had been hospitalized, and she's all better now almost, right? Getting there. Getting there. All right. So she's good enough to get into the studio. And this is going to be fun because rather than the very strict structure of the debates that uh, we had previous, we're going to get back to kind of what the show's format normally will be. And it's just going to be an interview. We're just going to have a conversation, just the two of us talking. I'll ask you some questions. Some of them may be uh, questions from the debates that other candidates have answered. Um, But we're just going to have kind of a a regular conversation. And I, I forgot to start the clock, you know, just so I can be safe and not give anybody knocking over headphones off the table not giving anybody any extras you know so i get accused we get we've already been accused of uh giving you preferential treatment because you didn't have to debate your opponents you know people over facebook think that they can run my show better than (laughs) i can run my show i always love that you know um but it's just gonna be a casual conversation and you know as we were doing uh the other debates some things uh came up um, and so before we get into that stuff, why don't you just go ahead, tell us about yourself. Take a few minutes, tell us who you are, why you're running for school board, all that good information. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate it. So I'm Mary Foremaster, and I am from southern Utah. I went to high school down in St. George, and I've lived in Cedar City for the past 22 years. My husband was born here, so his mom is a Cedar High class of 69, so we have a lot of extended family here in Cedar City and history here. Um, I I was in banking for 16 years. That's been my career, but my passion has always been in education. So even as I was in, in, I had my job and and did the banking thing, I was going to school. I did um, elementary and secondary education and business management because of my job. And when I had the opportunity, I, I would work in the schools. I, I was a paraprofessional for Cedar, at Cedar High School and for the district. And I, um, it, even for the bank, I would take any opportunity to teach financial literacy in the classrooms around Southern Utah. So, Boy, that's a subject that we really <laughs> need to be teaching in schools. Not true. So the reason I'm, I'm running is because I love our kids and I want what's best for them. And I, um, I have two kids, one... Uh, we'll be starting kindergarten in the fall and one starting uh, seventh grade. So I stalked you, and I got to tell you, both your kids are cute, but that little one is just <laughs> adorable. She looks like a little chipmunk. She is so cute. <laughs> She's a little firecracker. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, she, uh, both k- girls, I'm already seeing there is a huge generation gap between just those the, the seven-year difference. And so I'm really intent on focusing on today's kids who learn different, think different, act different. Uh, it, it's just a whole new ball game here. And we... Um, it, it's an unprecedented generation with the things that they're that they're facing and things they've had access to since they were born. Um, so we need to kind of relook things the way they're being taught in schools, um, how and what they're being taught, um, and that's one of my main reasons. Um, another thing I I'm really passionate about is our teachers. I I feel our teachers need more support and trust from board members and from the community. I, am, I worry about teacher turnover. We're seeing that happen more. Um, it, it, it's statistically they're they're only staying on board about five years now, where it used to be a long-term thing, and it, we've just made it hard for teachers. They're, 
they're being spread pretty thin. And I think we just crossed that threshold where the majority of the teachers are nearing retirement age. True. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, that's, that is going to be a big problem coming up. It is. And we want quality teachers in our schools and, and we hire professionals and we should treat them as such and, and respect them and support them and let them teach. So Now, I want to go back to something you said where, where we need to get out of their way and, and let them mm-hmm. do what they're doing. Um, there, there has been an awful lot of uh, criticism from parents and uh, controversy over some of the materials that are being taught in school, but also some of the access that parents are not able to have uh, in, in seeing what's being taught. Um, yeah, obviously, we've, we've had people say, you know, we don't want to have a, a teacher have to map out their entire plan by plan, day by day curriculum uh, from start to finish. But seeing the materials, where those materials come from, and, and parents having access to that, how do you feel about parents being involved in that process? Well, absolutely, parents. We are the primary guardians of our children. And so we should be involved 100% in what is going on in the classroom. We should know what they're being taught and how they're being taught. There should be transparency, and when it comes to hiring teachers, we need to vet and make sure that they understand what is appropriate and and stick to curriculum, Um, and that's important, of course. And I think it it's going pretty well. I don't I don't think that it's thirty seven percent of uh, fourth graders are reading at fourth grade level. Does that sound like it's going pretty well? No, (laughs) our. I, I was thinking more about people bringing in ideologies and things like that. But as far as academics, no, we we are falling behind and we are really struggling. And I worry, too, about the COVID effect where they're falling even further behind. I worry about Common Core. I just feel like it's not enough. They, the teachers, uh, I, I hope we get a second look at curriculum and be able to change back to the full curriculum that, that used to be taught. And Common Core was a dismal, dismal failure. It, it really was, was. horrible. It, it, it did not. It's not helping our kids. I worked on No Child Left Behind under the the Bush administration, and I'll tell you that wasn't perfect by any means, but it was way and above what we tried to do with Common Core. And uh, man, I'm I'm so glad that we're looking to get away from that curriculum and and how that stuff is taught. I mean, kids are going into college, and and they can't perform at the level that they're expected to perform at college because they were taught Common Core. And the professors at SUU are really, really frustrated. frustrated. I'm finding that, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let, let's talk about the elephant in the room right now. Uh, as we were doing the last debates, um, a, a piece of excrement walked into a school in Ovalda, Texas, uh, Ross Elementary School, and uh, killed 19 children. And I mean, just inexcusable evil uh, we won't mention his name on this program we're not going to give him uh, what he was looking for that notoriety but what do you feel as a parent and as a candidate for school board we should be doing to ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen here in our community getting me fired up from the start <laughs> you know our schools have done so much to try to keep our kids safe and it is appalling to me that, and, and this is a more of a political, it, unfortunately it shouldn't be, um, the access to firearms, it to me, is the problem. At the kid, what more can the schools do? You know, we, we've locked the perimeters, we've got cameras in place, we have kids practicing how to evacuate and hide yeah, in the but bathroom. But do we? Because I just I just drove over because a parent was talking to me about access at South Elementary, and you're on the South Elementary Community mm-hmm. Council. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's two fence holes that have no gates on them at all, on the east side and on the south side. Uh, so there's complete access to that playground for the kids to leave and for people to come into there. The, between the preschool and the playground, uh, for the elementary school, there's like a three-foot fence. You could yeah. hop that. Yeah. Uh, so have we locked it down i was just at canyon view high school we had to go and uh, do an iep for my girlfriend's daughter um and we walked in the wrong door and we wandered through the entire high school before we got to the office and found the office nobody confronted us nobody uh wanted to stop us we have open campuses at cedar high and canyon view high school where kids can come and go so have we really done what we need to do as a community here to ensure the safety of our children well, we obviously can do better. 
there needs to be the locking of the perimeters. I know I've run into the problem not being able to get into South. Um, it, the front door is open in the morning. Um, Mr. Oldroyd stands guard there as kids come in and out. And um, I've heard stories of kids, you know, being released to people that they shouldn't be. And surely, but, yeah, the school district's being sued for that. One of the kids got kidnapped. Oh my gosh, surely, flown to Denver. There, there's definitely work to do in keeping the schools more contained and 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 those securities in place. And and that's something that we should do not right now. Make sure you know the perimeters are locked, so that they're safe, that people can't just wander in. I think the gun issue is a cop out. I really do. I, I like just uh, last night in, in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, gunmen opened up on a crowd of twelve people at a graduation party, and an armed resident shot him, stopped him. Nobody else was killed, and so it, it's kind of a cop out to say we should limit access to guns. I, I say we need to arm teachers. In fact, I'm offering a free, and anybody listening to this, I'm offering free firearms training class to any employee of the Iron County School District who brings me a an ID that'll be on June 11th and it'll be right here in my studio which is also my firearms training classroom. In fact, you're sitting in a room that has about 40 guns in it right now. Oh. Nobody's getting killed. <laughs> I'm a little In fact, I'm wearing one right now. now. See? <laughs> Yikes. I wear one I every day every week. <laughs> because you know why? I I'll, I'm going to tell you why. I pray. I pray that if something like Uvalde goes down, that I'm there and in a position to stop it. And I pray that if it's not me, one of my students will be there to stop it. There were armed police officers at Evalde who did nothing. They well, were standing outside with guns. They were standing outside, and, and that was a mistake, and that's a whole different conversation. I, I've trained police officers for almost 30 years. Um, they made the mistake of thinking it was a hostage situation, and so the protocol for a hostage situation is different than for an active shooter they situation. They hear gunshots. Oh, I know, I know. I know it's a different conversation, and when you it say is. it's a cop-out, we are the only developed nation in the country that has this epidemic of these mass shootings oh no they happen all over the place no, they happen in, not to in, the extent they, they happen here it is they outrageous. they've happened in australia they've happened in um what's the little country island off of the coast of australia i'm trying to think new zealand new zealand thank you i keep thinking friesland for some reason uh new zealand they've happened in france they've happened in germany just recently but there's random shootings but the extent that we have them here daily is just it's ridiculous I mean, there's no excuse. So, well, yeah, I, feel I think we need strongly. to have a bigger conversation about what are we doing to identify and stop, stop these kids um, from being isolated, being locked out of society, being bullied, being all of these problems. And we've got we had a bullying problem so bad at Cedar High School that a 17 year old shot himself in the face. Uh, it was a young man I cared greatly about. I actually, as a, an ordained minister, preached his funeral. So and he would horribly bullied, and it had been reported over and over and over again, and nothing was done. In fact, Shannon Delaney had the gall to report to the federal government that no incidents of bullying had been reported the year that he killed himself. So what what is your thoughts on how do we stop the bullying epidemic that's going on within our schools because it's bad it's really really bad well dan that's another one of the things i'm pushing is i am a firm believer in educational or, or i'm sorry emotional learning emotional intelligence is just as important as academic intelligence and more so with this new generation it may i may not have felt the same way 10 years ago i may have said they need to learn these things, these skills at home. Well, I'm a mother, and I'm teaching my children these things. I want it supplemented at school. They're learning. If they can't read, they learn to read at school. They need to learn how to deal with the things that they're feeling. And we have therapists in our school and counselors, and we need to bring them in. I know our community is against SEL, social emotional learning. I can see the frustration when you buy a package from a corporation to try to instill into curriculum. You don't know what's going out there. So mm -hmm. I would propose we come mm -hmm. up with our own program that meets our community values using our therapists and, and, and counselors in our school as a, as a board so that we can work together and come up with our own 
emotional learning plan for our students. I think that sounds great. I, I do get concerned when you talk about a prepackaged canned program and Me where too. it's coming from and what other garbage is in there and does it align with the values of this community. I get really worried, but I also get worried. And I think Billy Davis in the debate really summed it up well. He just called it noise. And it seems like our schools are becoming centers of social justice rather than centers of education and academia. And that, that concerns me as a voter and, and as somebody who uh, is concerned about what our children are learning. Uh, sure. Why don't we go back to just teaching the academics, let the values be taught at home? Because we're in a different world. And the kids need to have those things instilled with their peers right now. They are isolated. They are now on devices. They are they interact differently. Even when they when they're together, they interact differently. And I feel like I can see that because I have children that age and they, their peers, and I'm seeing how different this generation is. It's different time. We need to address the needs of our kids today, not kids even from my generation kids today they need that help they need the to l be learning responsibility and civility and how to cope because resilience is a big problem right now but it seems like we're not teaching that right we're we used to teach values that resonated with most americans we right. used to teach citizenship um we used to teach patriotism we used to teach americanism american exceptionalism and, and now it's it's crt and it's CRT it's, is not being taught. Okay, so we call taught. it a different name. All right. So what, yeah, what CRT is, is a postgraduate program that is taught, and and but we take pieces of that and, and we pull it into the schools, the, the Iron Stories, and and we are indoctrinating children more than we're educating them. And I like that that way Billy Davis said that is noise. You know, why don't we get through some of this noise, stop focusing on trying to teach your values or somebody else's values in schools, let those values be taught at home. What about, you said we used to learn about responsibility and civility in school. That's not even being taught. Right, I know. So that is part of emotional learning. And we have to help children know how to cope today. And we're teaching them at home. I'm teaching them at home. The, I don't know if you noticed the flags on Main Street on the, sure on the holidays. Do you know who puts those up in the wind in the morning on a holiday morning? It used to be the Boy Scouts. I don't know if, the scout, <laughs> if they exist anymore, do they? <laughs> My 12-year-old daughter and her peers in our neighborhood get, got up on President's Day, January, windy, cold. They could have slept in, put up the flags, and went back at dusk and took them down. Not just Main Street, but a bunch of streets in town. We are trying to teach our kids service, patriotism, community. We want them to think outside themselves. I'm doing that at home, but I want it taught at school. I want it reinforced at school. I want their peers to be learning it with them. It resonates better with these kids today when they have their friends that they can practice these skills with. They are leaving college. They're leaving, well, when they graduate, whether they go to college or not, they're not prepared to face the world anymore. They don't. They can't even sit down for a, a job interview. I mean, there's so much. God forbid they try to work. Is <laughs> it, what I'm saying is our generation is this generation is different, and we have to re we have to look at the way we're teaching and how and what we're teaching and, and alter to our kids. Now, one of the big things that I've, I've heard parents talk about in this generation being different is they're a generation that spends a lot more time in front of a screen. And so I see a lot more of the, the teaching being done with a computer, right. They're clicking keys and, and looking at a, key, at a screen instead of having interactive conversations with a teacher instructing them. Um, do you think that that is the future of education? You know, I, when I was in secondary education, it was almost 20 years ago, I'm dating myself, it, uh, tech and ed was the big push, and we, we worked really hard to start incorporating technology in education. It was so important. Well, again, back to the generation now. These kids are born tech savvy. They are. And, I, and so I think we need to reverse direction a little bit and pull back on this tech. And handing out Chromebooks to first graders is not okay. We need, I believe we need to go back to the lab system where yes, of course they need to work on technology, our, our world runs on technology, but what about teacher interaction and engagement? What about kids talking to each other in class and working in groups and going to a lab to work on their Chromebooks instead of just being handed a Chromebook when they walk in and have all of their work there, go home and work on it more at home? 
that's doing no favors to our children. No, I like the Chromebook because I, I remember carrying around a 20-pound backpack when I was in school. My daughter still does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, if if the books could be on, on the Chromebook, I'd have no problem with that. You know, that it saves a lot of money. Um, it saves a, a lot of trees. I'm, I like trees. Um, and it saves a lot of backs and, and doesn't require those kids to carry that around. But I, I don't, I worry about the, the instruction in the classroom on that screen. And, you know, having the ability to take that, the Chromebook home and work on your work there, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I think kids get way too much homework. <laughs> way too much homework. Yeah. The teacher engagement to me is very important and um, peer interaction is very important to me. And I feel like they're losing that with, with the devices. And uh, where I'm saying the kids are born tech savvy now, they can, they can penetrate firewalls. So we have kids on oh. YouTube in the back room of science and they're looking up tutorials. So that's what's happening in our Yeah, I, right we now. just went through that with my girlfriend's 13-year-old daughter. She figured out how to disable the parental controls oh, based course. on a YouTube video. You know, they're, it was great. They're little hackers. They're awesome. And that's yeah. what's exciting is this generation is amazing. And so we, we really need – I've done so much research and study for, just for my two girls just to kind of stay ahead of the game. And in all that I've learned, that's why I'm running is because I want to – to share that at the, at the table when it comes to policy and, and curriculum and say, this is what I'm learning about these kids and we wanna bring out the best in them and they're so smart. And we wanna be able to pull that out and help them learn, help them read, help them be better at ma math and science. But we also have to address the emotional side too. Okay. Um, one of the big issues, we, we just passed a $69 million bond so that we can tear down uh, East Elementary and rebuild with two extra classrooms. And we've heard a lot of people talking about the fact that we need to postpone that, I think, um, and look at building a new school out in the West. What, what do you think of that? You know, it was unfortunate that there was not enough foresight when that decision was made because our community has just exploded. And so now we have to really, re, uh, if we can relook at that bond that the voters elected on, which um, really isn't going to serve the purpose it needs to, which is to have a school where the kids are. And the kids are in the west, north, south, not in the east, unfortunately. And that's where the school would go. And so I'm pretty fiscally conservative and I don't wanna have to worry about you know the busing and all the, the money that goes into to having to accommodate that. So yeah, I'm. That's a good question. Can we re, can we re reverse course on on the bond that was agreed on and and rebuild in a in an area where the kids are? Yeah, that's always the catch up, right? With government agencies, is they're always building to what the need is now, and it takes years to get there, right? To what the need is at the time that they start the building. So by the time they get done, it's it's already time to build something new. Sure. We never look ahead and go, hey, let's uh, let's build something with extra capacity, so that when you know we don't have to be doing this every year, building something new. Uh, that's that's rough. That uh, you know the, the government contracting process is so <laughs> cumbersome and. We, I Water could, red tape. Yeah, I mean, I could build something for a tenth of what the government can build mm -hmm. it for because of the, you know, they've got to do the contracting process and, and meet certain requirements. And, you know, it's it's rough. The private sector seems to always do things better. Um, let me ask you, uh, looking at the current makeup of the school board, sure. who do you find yourself <laughs> most aligning with on the current Iron County School District Board? That's hard to say because they each bring their strength. They each have I ideas and ideals in there, and they are pretty open to listening. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's hard to pinpoint one person where I say, I, I think like that person. I, I, I liked when um, controversial subjects were brought up, how uh, Michelle, is it Michelle Lambert, mm -hmm. she... She said, we need to think about the children. We're talking about individuals here. We're talking about lives. We're talking about stories of people. You know, we have to remember that when in all our decision making. And, and I, I, that's what I feel strongly is, is how is this going to impact these kids and their families and the teachers? I, every decision impacts so many lives. And so rather than rushing to decisions based on people's ideals, you need to really consider the individual. It is. We got a bunch of little individuals, right? We and do. That's the biggest, I think, challenge for 
any government agency or, or entity is we try to make broad sweeping policies that uh, you know help the most people that's usually the goal we don't usually get achieve that goal but that's usually the goal but yeah it is there's a bunch of individuals out there and to, to think that one solution is going to work for an entire block of people uh, I, I think we can get real short-sighted that's on that true. and so that brings me to the topic of special education mm-hmm. in in iron county um, i've heard from several parents and and after i asked the question during the debates i've heard from a lot more i shouldn't have my phone number out there where everybody can call me um, <laughs> but apparently iron county is really not getting the job done as far as following state and federal law uh, especially with IEP creation, uh, deadlines are getting missed, and, and there's some real problems with that, and people aren't being put into the right environment uh, according to their IEPs. What would you do as a school board member to ensure that we are in compliance with federal and state law when it comes to special education students and meeting those needs? Well, that's another one of my concerns when it comes to staffing and the issues we're having with turnover and hiring the right people for the right jobs. And that's uh, th- something we definitely need to, need to address because these children need, and and that another thing I'm pushing. I have a lot of things I'm so passionate about is diversity. Mm-hmm. And when I talk, pe- when I say diversity, people assume it, it has to do with ethnicity or culture. You know, it, it has to do with special education. Anybody who is in the margin that needs extra help, that is, you know, we have to address diversity 100%. That. That is something, you can't even say the word without people getting a little, you know, taken aback or, or don't, you know, we don't want to go down that path. And No, we're talking about special needs kids, too. We want equity for our special needs kids. Sorry. I'm starting to pound the table. Starting to pound the table. (laughs) It's real loud when you pound the table. (laughs) Um, I love diversity. You know, it it brings so many flavors, and especially food, because I really love food. Um, But the culture, I mean, you you lived for a while in Mexico. Well, I am Mexican. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, when I say I was a paraprofessional at Cedar High School, I wanted to be the person that I wished I'd had when I was in school here in Utah. And that's someone who could, you know, know what I was going through and help me. I didn't have an advocate to help me with my schooling. My parents didn't speak the language. And somebody that could help me and talk to my teachers and help me understand what I needed to do to pull my grades up. So that was what I went in to do, is to help kids to pull their grades up. And and I felt kind of uh, like a freak a little bit when I was a kid because I you know the language at home and the cultural differences and the you know the the language being spanish yeah. instead of english yeah and and the skin color you know that's a thing and i i just wish it was more addressed and talked about i think our leadership needs training on it i think our kids need training on it i mean mm-hmm. the the prejudice is ridiculous it's, yeah. it's ignorant and it's stupid um people are different and the cultures are different i i think the best cure for that is travel i mean i i've traveled all over the world and and worked with and, and interacted with people from different cultures and different societies and, and different countries and it's been wonderful That's awesome. i'm also a jarhead uh so in the marine corps you know there's only one color you're all green <laughs> and uh and no one is better than anyone else you're all equally worthless Uh, (laughs) so um no i think i think exposure to those different cultures is is wonderful and i think it one of the great things you know i'm I'm not lds uh but one of the great things i've always thought that the church did really well was encouraging kids to go on a mission and and go to different places different cultures get out of utah see how other people live and and i always thought that's that's really awesome it's too bad we can't bring that in at you know like third grade right you know how do we how do we bring that in at third grade how do we expose children to the different cultures I love watching um, two two children of different cultures, young. They don't even recognize that there's anything different, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, a meme on, on TikTok or Facebook. I can't remember which it was, but it's two little girls. One's black and one's white and are dressed the same. And, and the little girls are like, look, we're twins. They don't notice anything different. And I, how do we keep that? Where does that change? And, and how do we try to strive to keep that recognition that we're, so what? Our color is different. Well, who mm-hmm. cares? Uh, that's the best question. <laughs> you know, I believe that it it starts with the adults, the leadership, and, and we need to be willing to talk about it 
I don't know what people are so afraid of, you know, to talk about. Oh, I absolutely about. think we need to talk about race in this country. Right? All, we need to have that conversation. Yeah. Speaking of that, you had a picture on your Facebook page that maybe you can explain to me because it says that it's a woman wearing a shirt. It says, protect innocent black boys the way you protect guilty white boys. What What is the context of that? The context of that was during the whole uh, George Floyd assassination that happened in front of all of our eyes. Okay. And then um, having Kyle Rittenhouse be able to just go somewhere he shouldn't have even been. He had no business being there, and he took an AR. And he'd been boasting about the AR before he went. He shot two people, and they're dead, and he was acquitted. So he actually shot three people. Um, so, So we're making a moral equivalency between a man who was attacked, tried, and exonerated in court... So under the American Constitution, that person is innocent. Right. Right. Under our laws of justice, that person is innocent. Mm -hmm. Um, And a man who was dead before the police arrived just didn't know it, according to the autopsy results. The combination of barbitol and fentanyl that he had consumed, he was a dead man walking. Um, And yes, that officer Chauvin did fail to exercise the duty of care that he had to his prisoner. He was negligent. He was callous. He was judge, jury, and executioner, and George Floyd was alive. Well, you could hear him talking. Yeah, but he was going to be dead very breath. shortly. That wasn't anyone's decision to make. Well, it had no, nothing that anybody could have done would have created an intervention that would have stopped that. According to the autopsy results, he was he was a dead man walking, and so to We're say going off the rails a little bit. We are, from the but school but board. to say that. A person that has been exonerated in a court of law, which we consider to be an innocent individual, Mm -hmm. is a guilty white boy uh, versus a a man that never had a trial. Maybe he should have, but I don't think he was ever going to get there based on the decisions he made. It wasn't prior to that. We're talking about the kid with the skittles in his pocket who was shot and killed again. I mean, innocent in a court of law. I was infuriated with these with these kids that are just taken down it, it, I posted that and I was actually recomm- it, somebody advised me to take it down before I ran for an why should you? you should be able to post whatever you want that, that represents who you are Thank and people you. can voters can make a decision if they align with those beliefs yeah. or not that's why we have these conversations in the first place right Thank you so you know I, I I absolutely <laughs> um, but speaking of First Amendment protections sure. we recently had a teacher in Parowan. A high school teacher, social studies teacher, um, post that he believe he wishes that more Republican lawmakers would be killed um, based on the January 6th events of 2021. Uh, he wishes next time more Republican lawmakers would be killed. And uh, he, he was not terminated. He was relocated to a behavioral high school uh, as a result of those comments. His students saw those comments, right? And there was a lot of parents who were very upset uh, that he was posting that kind of thing. What do you think is the the threshold there that a teacher should be able to express himself on social media, um, you know, where his students can see that? Yeah, the First Amendment. Of course, we have our freedom of speech, but as a professional, you are going to be held accountable for what you say. So you have to be. If you're a professional, you need to be responsible in what you say. And, and you can say it, you have that freedom, but you don't have the freedom from the consequence. So people should think before they speak, everyone, teachers or not, that it was a very irresponsible thing to say. It was threatening and, you know, he could have lost his job. Maybe he should have. Well, I guess under the, the policy in place at the time, there was no social media policy as a result of that. It was one good outcome is that they now have a social media policy um, that says that if you reflect poorly or, you know, in a negative way on the school district, then, then you can be terminated. Um, but yeah, that really created a lot of waves within the community that, you know, a teacher uh, with impressionable young people which every student out there is an impressionable young Absolutely. person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we forget that sometimes. Yeah. I think we lose sight of the fact that th- these are impressionable students and, and anything we say leaves an indelible mark on them and their psyche, on their on emotional health. Uh, They're little sponges. They really are. I'm learning that. You know, I, I don't have any kids myself. My girlfriend has, an, uh, uh, now she's 12, and a 13-year-old daughter. And 13-year-old is autistic. And God bless her, that has been fun. 
That has been a real fun ride. I so just fun. she has the, the way she looks at the world is mm-hmm. so different. No guile. Just a purity. It's yes. so fun. It really is. I've never really, until recently, kind of appreciated what parents go through, and I'm not. I'm not dad. I get reminded all the time. You're not dad. Um, you know. But that's that's fine. They've they've got their dad, and I love that they have a relationship with their dad, and that's great. But it, it's really opened my eyes. They are sponges. They're always watching. Oh yeah. And they soak you know, it all up. And, and we've got to really strive. And I think when we talk about race, mm-hmm. uh, there, there you go, right? Well, that's the problem. They're just repeating yeah. what they see at home, aren't they? When there's a, you know, well-intent parents, they're, they're not racist, but they don't realize. Some you know, of them are. <laughs> <laughs> some of them are. Some of them are. But even the ones who aren't, they're good people with good intent. But if their child says, oh, that boy with the black skin and the parent says, oh, you can't say that. You know, that already is, is putting a stigma in that child's head. Okay, they must, that must not be a good thing to say. We better not talk about that. It already puts them at a lower level. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, yeah, it differentiates them very much, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. And, it, and it, it almost makes it seem less than. You can't say that. They're, they're black. You can't talk about black skin. Yeah, that's the problem. Those are the things that are happening that are building up these ide- ideas in kids' heads. And that's why racism is is so prevalent isn't it funny we can we can talk about somebody having blonde hair Mm -hmm. but we can't talk about them having brown skin or brown black skin right you know yeah Yeah, why (laughs) that's exactly it's it's a level of distinctiveness i love that i love the color and you know I, i i like to tell people vanilla ice cream's okay but a little chocolate syrup on top makes it taste better and more interesting so well uh what other issues do you see as being kind of a big thing that we're not focusing on or we need to be focusing more on well diversity was the big was the biggest one because it, it's just not talked about at all do you think we can really solve the diversity problem in utah when we don't have much diversity <laughs> surprisingly i was looking through my daughter's yearbook and i would say about a quarter of the kids were of color and so yeah it's more that's than, a change it's more than we even realize and so why aren't we addressing it that, um, how, do, how do we address that? And, and it starts with the adults. I, I think we need to instill a program, a, a resource for the teachers and for the administrators to understand cultural diversity. And then it can be passed down to the children. And even having books, you know, that talk about skin color. And, and it, it's an embracing cultural differences. And I thought it was sad that it had to go to the school board level to decide to let Native Americans wear regalia to their own graduation. And and what about the Polynesians? And, and it's sacred to them to wear the lace. But isn't that kind of a backlash of, uh, I don't know, maybe the political correctness that we've been seeing in this country where people are like, well, we don't want anything that would be disruptive and, and we can't have an American flag on a shirt. We can't wear yes. regalia to our graduation. Yes. Nothing that differentiates. Can't wear a cross around it's your neck. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous, yeah. It, we need to be open to each other. And, and that's the problem is that this wokeism is is cancel culture everything that's just ruining us you know we ha- we're afraid to speak because we want to offend somebody and it's gotten out of hand we need to really i remember i, I was a kid in, in southern california i was in elementary school in, in san diego and we would we would have cinco de mayo celebrations in school <laughs> you know so that we could we could celebrate the the hispanic culture that was all around us i mean it was mm-hmm. southern california um, well, you know what's ironic about that is it goes. It's back. not even a real Mexican holiday. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say while well, we're talking about ignorance, but, but it was not, there was an I'm excuse not, not, not to, to talk just, about the right. Diversity. And I love that, and I love that they do that here too. They had mariachis and everything on Cinco de Mayo. But if you go to Mexico, nobody knows what nobody the name it. means. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an American holiday that happens to celebrate. It's an excuse to drink <laughs> lots of tequila and eat tacos. Right. Which you know, I don't see a reason not to have an excuse to right? have. <laughs> Well, the fifteenth of September is their is their Fourth of July. Yeah, just, yeah, their Mexican Independence Day. There. Yeah, yeah, we never celebrate that. Uh, most of the, are the schools back in and then on the fifteenth of September uh-huh. and most yeah. times. Oh, well, we should be celebrating that. We should, I, I agree. We should that have should a good be time the, party the with it. Mile Day. That yeah. actually means something to Mexicans, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> But I think it's great that we're we're doing things, uh, or at least we used to more do things that would expose people to the Polynesian cultures and right. and black cultures, and which it's, which that's really hard to do because there's not a single black culture. Uh, there's 
hundreds so of, many yeah but it's just so much more to learn and there to is embrace and to appreciate and instead of being afraid of i yeah fear you know they, they always say travel is, is fatal it's fatal to fear it's f- fatal to uh, ignorance or racism that. to yeah. you know i, I wish I think, everybody could just God, travel i wish everybody would travel i know you know i love seeing the kids i, I lived in washington dc for a long time 15 years and i i love seeing these school groups go to washington dc to see the the seat of where it all is going on right the supreme court congress the white house i um, love washington dc love trips like that and i know that during uh those trips a lot of those kids have to raise that money on their own and so i see kids selling things washing cars mm-hmm. doing that kind of stuff what do you think we should do as, as a school board as taxpayers to to help encourage those kinds of trips to go on oh i think we should definitely encourage those kinds of trips and they and they do still happen they do have trips to dc that kids can get in but are we only allowing the the privileged children that's a good question yeah we need how, to how make do we it help accessible. those underprivileged we need to make it accessible to to everyone and if it comes down to to fundraising and and that kind of thing we definitely need to look at that and i was on the pta for a long time at south and we did fundraisers all the time so you know we there's money people are always willing to to donate to education and so it's there and we just need to work to get it so i remember a bumper sticker i was on 395 and bumper to bumper traffic trying to get into washington dc and i was passing the pentagon and there was a bumper sticker in front of me it says i long for the day when we have to hold a bake sale to buy a b-52 bomber and our <laughs> children all get our education for free or something like that you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i found it ironic oh, that it i was you know ir- passing the, the pentagon it comes you know? to public education and there is now money. you mentioned being on the pta mm-hmm. and and i think a lot of parents now are starting to kind of wake up and more so than had in the past and so i would like to know uh, how parents can get involved with the PTA and also with the school councils because you're on the South Elementary School Council okay. mm-hmm. and what that is and, and what they do and, and how parents can be involved in that process. Thank you for asking that. I've actually been knocking on a lot of doors meeting people in my district and, and talking to parents. They're asking me the same thing. So it's important for them to know that we all the every single school is asking for PTA volunteers so they can volunteer um, dads, moms, anyone, they'll, they'll take in, you know, they want help. So anyone can volunteer to be on a PTA and that's easy. What, what do those make. volunteers do? It depends on what the PTA's initiatives for the year are. There's, you know, there's fairs, they, the book fairs, they have um, teacher recognition, they have Red Ribbon Week. There's just things throughout the year that they're constantly doing. So parents can come in and help in, in any of those areas, but also volunteering, volunteer to read in classrooms. That's a great way to be involved. That's a great way to see how the teachers are teaching. You know, you just said people are worried. Go volunteer and go to the principal and say, put me in your hardest class, you know, so they can see what teachers are up against right now. And I think there'll be a lot more um, compassion and understanding toward our teachers instead of so much criticism, you know, and um, getting into the classroom volunteering those are you know pta there's just so many opportunities to help and and parents want to parents want to be involved and, and there's just so many ways to and so involved. so what are the school councils the community councils. yes so they are um elected also in onto the the councils in their schools and, and where do they run where do the the members of the council run or, or? well i i tried to get in on the cedar middle school council and it was just a matter of submitting your name and then people vote. I think the prior council votes on the names of who they should be on on the council. And they are, um, it's mostly trust land uh, um, decisions, the funding, and where it should go and having... See, a lot of people don't understand that Utah, Mm -hmm. when the state was founded, set aside large tracts of land um, for schools to utilize, to either sell, to build schools on, to raise money. Exactly. Uh, it was, and, it and was the brilliant Sitla foresight. Lands, it yeah. really was. Mm-hmm. It was amazing foresight. And we still utilize these Sitla lands today. Mm-hmm. And so the, the local school councils oversee yes. the Sitla lands in their area. Mm-hmm. They can act as fiduciaries and, you know, speak for the stakeholders within their community. So that's what community councils ha- can do. And so sign up to be on that and see if you're voted in. How much influence in, do they have on issues at that local school? 
the community council. Mm -hmm. um, there's usually things presented, and they can say I agree or no. And and if it's if the community council doesn't all agree, then they'll relook at issues. So they're significant. So they work with the principal. Uh, yeah, or they the work principal with, okay. is there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I think more is. parents need to know about that yes. and be involved in that because you know not everybody feels that they can serve on the school board. It's a daunting task it because really you're is. overseeing tax <laughs> policy, you're overseeing construction, you're overseeing the largest workforce in the county. Um, you know, there's a lot that administratively goes into being on a school board. Um, so, yeah, being able to be involved on that local level, I think it's great that people know about that. I, I wish more parents were getting involved with that and the PTA. Yes. These people are busy. That's true. People are so busy, and it seems to get worse every year. We get busier and busier and busier. And so trying to find ways that we can be informed and stay up to date on what's going on, God help them. I mean, it's it's rough, you know. Mm -hmm. the, um, one thing I really appreciated that Superintendent Hatch did recently is he broke down all of the initiatives that the school is either required by state, required by district, or optional. And I counted 96 initiatives, which is just proof of what our teachers are having. And how many of those were funded mandates? <laughs> uh, probably the district or the the federal required. And so, um, yeah, there's just a lot of work to be done, a lot of areas that need to be filled. Um, but we're, all, we're doing this for our kids. We want them to succeed. We want them to have good bright futures and that's the thing a lot of people don't realize is when you join you become a member of a school board sometimes you are mandated to implement bad policies and laws because they're the law and they come down from the state and you've got to make that work in your district you know school boards should have legal rep representation i don't know if if our district does or not. I think we do, but I don't know that he's at every council meeting or school board meeting. Well, they should be, I, especially I now, because um, we really have to start scrutinizing policies. And at the last meeting, there was one where um, it was almost a, a, a feeling of defeat. You know, this is federally mandated. We can't do anything about it. Well, I went home and did some research, and Utah is a opt-in, opt-out state. So, yes, we can do something about it. We can opt out of that federal But if account. we opt out, we opt out of the money, too. That's and true. A lot of people don't want to let That's go true. of that money. Mm -hmm. Mary Foremaster, it's been a pleasure having you in the studio today. I Thank wish we you. had more time to talk. Real quick, tell everybody where they can learn more about what you stand for or how they can reach out and contact you. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram. I'm Mary Foremaster for School Board, and I have a website, uh, votemaryforemaster.com or uh, maryironcounty.com. Um, I have my phone number and uh, email on those sites. So I am 100% accessible. If you email me or even instant message me, I will respond right away. I want anybody to ask me anything. So So you're running for District Four? Yes. And I won't vote for you because Good. I live in District Three. So I don't <laughs> I don't get to vote in this school board election uh, at all. Mm -hmm. um, but for folks out there, you know, what I always tell folks is anybody listening to this, any of the candidates out there that align with your ideals and values and you feel would do a good job is worthy of your vote. Um, any candidate who will not be accessible and accountable to their constituents won't answer the tough questions, uh, like Tiffany Christiansen, who would not participate in this uh, this debate um, because things might be taken out of context. God bless her heart. Um, nobody like that deserves your vote. So I would vote for any of these candidates who would participate and uh, be part of being accountable. Um, but yeah, if you can't be accountable, uh, yeah, like well, I said, if bless people your heart. don't agree with what I have to say, you just have to remember that I'm, I would bring perspective to the board. I'm not going to go in there and push all my what I believe in on people. That's the great thing about collaboration. And well, I love to listen. At least so. you're willing to sit in the hot seat and take the hard questions. <laughs> I appreciate and the opportunity. There were a lot of people who thought, man, you're giving her uh, an advantage and it's not fair. I don't know. Do you feel that this was a fair interview? And and uh, I feel like it was, and I hope that people think it was because I don't want any unfair um, advantage over anybody. I, I'm willing to 
That's what I strive for in, in this program is to be fair and fair in all things. Mary Fora Master, thank you for coming in and thank, thank you all for listening. And you all have a great day and the rest of your week. Thank you for listening to what's really happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. We hope that you found this content to be worthwhile. We want to hear from you. So if you have any upcoming event that you'd like to share with our listeners, or if you represent a local group, we'd love to have you come into the studio. Just email us at contact at what's really happening su.com. We're also working on streaming this podcast live and have the ability for folks to call in and ask questions or share items of interest to residents of Southern Utah. Be sure to share share this podcast with your friends. And again, thanks for listening.